Awesome. Well, I'm glad to, to be with everyone again for this edition of Sump the, Pri the Priests, the Q&A, <laughs> Father Freedy, Father Adam. Um, hopefully not being too provocative, and yet we're open. Bring it. Whatever questions you have, and um, there have been a, a lot that are out there and um, that we haven't gotten to, that we've saved, and happy to, to keep diving in. So, Father Joe, would you start us off with the prayer? Yeah. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, come by means of the powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, your well-beloved spouse. We invite you, Holy Spirit, to come and lighten our minds, our hearts, our souls. Fill us, Holy Spirit, we ask you from the top of our head to the bottom of our feet. We ask that you would anoint this time together. And please just bless it and let it draw us closer to the heart of Jesus and set us on fire with greater love for you. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, Father Joe, I'm really excited to, to be with you. We've got... Um, a lot of questions, and this was one that was asked at our last time together, and I'm wondering if we can start off with this one that um, is a little personal, so whatever you're, you're willing to share, but... Um, I love personal questions. I, I like those more than theological questions. They're so much easier to answer. <laughs> I've always found it kind of a, a manipulative way to, to ask a question like, Mind if I ask you something personal? <laughs> like, uh, uh, yes, I do, actually. But I, I you, you... encourage personal questions. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, the question was, when did you first start to fall in love with Jesus? Oh, man. I would say, really, because I was raised, uh, I was raised in the charismatic renewal. And if you... You don't know, you know, if you're not familiar with that term, charismatic renewal, I guess. I was born in 79, so I'm, I'm 41. And I guess uh, in the 1970s into the 80s, this was really a big deal. Charismatic renewal, um, yeah, it can be characterized a lot of different ways, but charismatic simply comes from the word charis, which means grace. So this is a particular group of people in the Catholic Church that, and it also spread outside the Catholic Church that um, I think really, I don't know, the best portrayal would be welcome the Holy Spirit. There was a lot, a lot of other stuff that got mixed up in that that's real controversial and a bunch of different things. And we can talk about that if you want. But so this kind of understanding of a dynamic God, it was present in my life. I don't think I fully embraced it when I was, you know, you're a little kid. But I often tell my conversion story like mass was boring, God was boring, and that was there. But that was high school. That was really that was a high school, middle school thing for me. I remember as a young kid just praising God like with all of my heart. Then I started listening to this uh, African American preacher who I just loved. I can't remember his name right now, but one of my favorite preachers. I remember listening to him like literally as a little kid, and just being fascinated with him. And so I, I would say I fell in love with Jesus from a very, very young age. And, and people ask me about when did you know you were called to be a priest? And I had a con reconversion back to the faith. But I, I did, there was never, I can say with total honesty, there was never a time in my life that I didn't know I was called to be a priest. So I would also say there was never, there wasn't, and I could explain that more if people want to learn more about that or something, but yeah, I was like, oh, you want to be a fireman when you grow up, little Joey? I'd be like, no. <laughs> you know, like, you want to be a professional football player? Uh, yeah, no, I, I know what I'm meant to be. But anyway, you know, so I would say, yeah, when I was a very young kid, I, I loved I loved the Lord. If I can just ask as, as a follow-up, I mean, I don't know that too many people see, like, becoming a priest and falling in love is kind of – being the, the same journey, but you put them together. I mean, would you mind just talking a little bit about what, what that looks like? Or 
Um, Cause yeah. Yeah. I think maybe a lot of people would think you, you became a priest for a lot of different, a lot of different reasons and of just like maybe feeling a responsibility or guilty or something like, well, if I don't be a priest, nobody will, you know, I don't know, but <laughs> hopefully yeah. not, <laughs> please. I love the roles we play on these Wednesday and Sunday nights too, with you just throwing softballs to me. I, I greatly appreciate that. You know, oh, don't there's, worry. There, there's a number in the queue that are coming up for you. Yeah, I would. It's, it's, um, so, and it, I'm a priest because God invited me to be a priest. Father Adam's a priest because God, and I didn't look and say, you know, I really like what a priest does. That could go into, that goes into my discernment. I didn't look and say, oh, I, can, I can see myself doing that. Like, yeah, that was all there. But way before that, it was this falling in love. And inside of this love relationship was this invitation, follow me as a priest. So, yeah, I would say very much. It wasn't, I'm calling you to be a priest. I hope you get to know me now, Joe. It's, I fell in, just fell in love, fell in love, fell in love, fell in love, more deeper and deeper and deeper. And inside of this communication of love, just like a married couple, there was an invitation I want to. I want you to be my priest. So a man falls in love with a woman. They're falling deeper and deeper and deeper in love. And to the heart arises this: maybe we're called to live, to be together for the rest of our lives in this sacrament. That's what it was for me. You. It's awesome. Thanks for sharing. Um, yeah, as I'm thinking about it, uh, maybe something similar. I remember falling in love with the Lord early on, thanks to my parents just kind of teaching me and yeah I, I wasn't raised Catholic I was definitely raised Protestant so the idea of a, a personal relationship with Jesus I remember um, probably before the age of reason even just praying my heart out like yeah. asking Jesus to come into my heart you know and I didn't know what that meant exactly except that I knew that was um, the step of like I don't know coming to a relationship with Jesus but I'll tell you, like, nothing changed my relationship with the Lord more than seeing his love for me. Mm. So I remember I was probably 12 years old, and I went away to a camp, still not Protestant yet, and I got one of the, like, the best passion talks I've ever heard, right? Mm. Where And I was 12 years old. Like, I was almost, like, crying, horrified in fear of hearing about even the scourging. And I just never heard about the scourge. You read like John chapter 18, 19, and it's like one line. And then Jesus was scourged. But when I heard about like everything that went into the scourging, and then just to hear and like, and he did that for you. Like that's when I was just blown away and bowled over that. Yeah. Oh, this isn't just me. Like Jesus come into my heart. Jesus come into my heart. That's him. Like come into mine. Mm. And I was just like, I don't know, I've never been the same since. And yeah. just that understanding of, of uh, his love and continuing to go deeper into that. So beautiful. Great. All right. Well, no more softballs from here on out. Um, Father Joe, please tell us what is blessed salt and how do we use it? Great question. Uh, blessed salt or exercise salt is simply salt. There's a blessing that the church is given for salt. Um, and the reason salt is often used uh, with a formal blessing of holy water, you use salt. But off, the reason you can often use salt is because water evaporates. Now the blessing remains, but the salt uh, remains even more in its substance rather than water. So you use exercise, bless salt, just like you used exercise, bless water. And when you officially bless water, like I mentioned, you mix the salt in the water. So yeah, it's, it's something that we've kind of come fallen out of practice using is the blessed or exercise salt. Traditionally, we've done so much more with holy water because it is such a powerful sign of our baptism, but blessed and exercise salt is uh, yeah, really, really powerful. I had the opportunity of, um, being the 
the chaplain of Oakland Catholic High School, I went around, uh, blessed the, the whole school, and I just went all out. I got dressed up. I had um, cassock surplus. I had my cope and um, the holy water. And then I also had this bag of exercise salt. Yeah. Right. And so, like, all the girls are like, ah, I don't, I'm just like, crushing them with, I should have brought a super soaker. No, no, just like spraying with holy water. But then when I sprayed the salt, they're like, what's that for? Yeah. It's like, that's for expelling demons. Like, oh, okay. But it is, right? It's, it's the power of the sacramentals that God gives to water and salt that has been such a part of our church history for the longest time. And so um, I would highly encourage you to... Um, especially in this time where our church doors are still closed, but um, to as however you can to get sacramentals, especially holy water, but I would say exercise salt too. And to even just to go around your house and to sprinkle the exercise salt for, you have authority over your house yeah. as, as, as the owners, but especially as a family, mothers, but then especially fathers and your spiritual head of the household, you have that authority. Yeah. And to claim that and going around and really just claiming that house as your own, as a place of God, and to really cast out all, all evil, um, any sort of evil presence. Yeah, I love it. And just a little a lead into that the spiritual authority is so real. And especially those of you that have children, uh, make sure your children were baptized into Christ by your consent of faith. So the spiritual authority that a father has over a child or a mother has over a child is very powerful. So every night before I went to bed, I had to go to my mom or my dad and I kiss them each good night. But then they blessed me on the forehead and they blessed me on the forehead like that because you did that for your children. When the, after the priest makes a sign of the cross on the baby's forehead or the child's forehead, then the parents and the godparents are invited to do the same. And what they say is this, what the priest or deacon says is this, I claim you for Christ. And so I, I would just, even if you're, my mom still, I don't have any hair left. She used to bless me and then grab my hair and shake it. It drives me crazy. <laughs> but she'll still bless my forehead, even though I'm the, I'm the priest. Uh, so parents just have, just like you have particular spiritual authority over your home, that's very real. So you have very powerful spiritual uh, authority and an ability to bless your children. So make the sign of the cross on their forehead. They might look at you weird, but that's okay. So good. I just, yeah, I, it seems like too many Catholics, especially parents, don't realize that. But that's, that's a huge thing, uh, really allowing God to bless your children through you. Um, I don't know what last time we got on this like angel kind of theme, maybe we'll, we'll stick with um, evil exorcisms. I'm grateful for, for this question. Is it possible for God to allow someone to undergo spiritual oppression, obsession as a way to experience a cleansing of temporal sins on this earth before purgatory? So Father Joe, maybe if, if you could start off and um, just say like our, oftentimes we think of uh, exorcisms, like demonic possessions as like just in the movies, as it's like, as if it's just a genre of like, can you talk about just how about um, possessions, but then even before that, like that's like, there are different levels, huh? There's possession, there's um, oppression and obsession. And just like, are those real? And what do those mean? Yeah, so yeah, it's, it's a great thing. I just want just to give a little introduction. And Father Adam, maybe you can have Dave Van Bickle on one time. I think you guys would have a great conversation about this. But anytime you want to pack a church for a talk, you make it on demons or angels, you know, or, or the devil. For some reason, we're fascinated with evil and evil spirits. But I want to say this very clearly. The, the, the television is full of shows about evil spirits and conjuring. 
Go, you, you give a talk about Jesus Christ, there's going to be 10 people show up. But you give a talk about the devil or the demon, and it's packed. That's always kind of driven me crazy, and I get it. But God, Jesus Christ is infinitely more interesting than evil. Amen. Than evil. So I just want to set that tone out there. We're, we're kind of fascinated with the dark side. And it's like, sometimes that can be really unhealthy. So don't watch those shows, by the way. It's a bad idea. Um, is possession real? Yeah, you guys know it's real. We see it in the scriptures all over the place. Um, how do we know it's real? Because of the witness of the scriptures, because of the words of Jesus, because of tradition, and because of personal experience. Now, I, like I said before, I'm not the exorcist. I have prayed at a few exorcisms, and I can tell you from personal experience, it's very real. Father Adams had these experiences as well. Um, so what is, and this is nothing to be, we don't get afraid of the devil and the demons because they're totally powerless, but for what God allows them to do. And remember, there's way more good angels. They're, they're on a, a leash that God has. So anything that they're able to do that's destructive, God somehow in his perfect providence and his perfect plan permits that. So what is, what is, um, the, the, the worst thing that the devil does is not possession, it's temptation. Because what the demons want, and the devil, and Father Adam, you interrupt me if I'm going off on a tangent, if I'm talking, you know, just feel free to jump in and cut me off or something. What the devil, what the good angels want, and what God wants, is for you to live with them for all eternity. That's all your guardian angel wants. Your, your guardian angel's not interested if you make a lot of money, you become really popular, they, they just don't care. The only thing your guardian angel and all the angels wants is for you to live in heaven with them forever. Well, the demons mimic that. The only thing demons want is for you to live in hell with them forever. These creatures want you to live with them for all eternity. That's what struck me when I prayed my first exorcism. I'm like, these things want me to live with them for all eternity. It's bad. How does that happen? When I give my will over to choosing against God, so much so that at the end of my life, I say to God, no, I don't want you. That's what hell is. Hell is not God sending this angry God up there, sending you to hell because you didn't do. Hell is me choosing to be separated from God from all eternity. Heaven is me choosing to be with God for all eternity, right? And that's chosen by our actions while we're on earth. So, the worst thing that demons can do is temptation. They tempt you. Why is that the worst thing? Because when we're tempted and we sin, sin is only committed through our free will. And what the demons want us to do is get our free will to choose against God. Right? That's what temptation is. When we fall to temptation, I have chosen to separate myself from God by committing this sin. Obsession is when you demons can influence you, right, and get you obsessed about something. A lot of pornography would be that, right? Obsession about those things. Um, obsession about a woman. Obsession about a job. Obsession about an injury that I have uh, that's occurred to me. I can't forget. Opre obsession and and, and um, oppression are external. It feels like weight is on you. It's slavery from the outside. The way that that differs from possession is that somehow in possession, demons have been invited to come inside of my heart, right? So it's, it's operation from the inside of the person. And when a possession takes place, they, the, these demons can take over your faculties. And by faculties, I mean your motor skills, your ability to operate. So eyes in the back of the head type stuff, they, they can take over your faculties. That can't happen with oppression or, or uh, obsession. So that's just a, a simple little summary. Are possessions real? Yeah, they're real. Should we be afraid of them? Absolutely not. Should we be afraid of the devil? Absolutely not. Should we spend a lot of time thinking about the devil and demons? Absolutely not. Spend a lot of time thinking about Jesus. It's a great answer to, um, yeah, this, this question. And um, there's a, a lot there. Father Joe. 
a lot of questions are now coming in about. Someone's asking about like, um, and we were talking about spiritual authority and being able to claim that as owners of your house or of your family. Regarding exorcisms, do you know of any Protestant pastors who have successfully exorcised uh, a demon or someone possessed? I haven't, but I, that doesn't mean that it hasn't happened. Um, and also on a little quick side note, St. Catherine of Siena was a lay woman. She was a third order Dominican. And uh, when there were very tough cases of exorcisms in other parts of the country and the world, they would often write to St. Catherine of Siena, tell her the situation, ask her to pray for it, and she would, through her prayers, God would cast out the demons. So, I don't know about the Protestant thing, Father Adam, why don't you, why don't you speak to that? I know many Protestants, Protestant, <laughs> People have come to me recommended by Protestants and by Jewish rabbis because they didn't know what to do with this situation. Which is amazing. It's, and it's like, it's true. And it's our faith. And it's like the priest really stands in the person of Christ the head. And you can have a whole team of super spiritual people. And yet the demon just isn't going to be afraid of anyone except for the priest um, who brings in that that power to cast out the devil so great um a lot of you're asking about where do you get exercised salt um i'd say first and foremost your your parish priest if your parish priest um isn't interested or doesn't know what you're talking about <laughs> call me <laughs> i'll get you i have um, boxes of exercise salt. Um, great. Let's turn it up. There was a question about genuflecting. Does it matter which knee you genuflect with? Great question. Uh, I would say it does, yeah. But only because, I would only say this. I'm sure in God, the economy of salvation, God isn't real worried about that at all. But the right knee has always been the knee that you genuflect on is a sign of great reverence. Just like you shake somebody's hand, not that we're going to ever do that again for the next <laughs> thousand years or something, I don't know, crazy like that. But you don't throw out your left hand. You throw out your right hand. I, when I was a little kid, people would stick out their right hands, and I'd often stick out my left hand just to goof with them with that. I have to confess that. <laughs> shake hands with your right knee. You genuflect with your right knee. Um, I don't know what the theological underpinnings of right are. I think it's why, why the right knee. I think it's probably more just historical. The right hand, the right knee carried greater dignity with it. So that's why we do that. And, um, and so you know too, there's another pious tradition of whenever the blessed Lord in the Eucharist is exposed to genuflect on both knees. And Again, this isn't like a hard and fast rule, but it is, it is a praiseworthy practice that if the Lord is exposed in the Blessed Sacrament, so say you go somewhere where there's exposition um, and you're leaving before it's over, maybe it's a perpetual adoration chapel. Um, instead of just doing a, a genuflection on one knee, your right knee, as you would whenever he's reposed in the tabernacle, when he's exposed, that means metaphysically, like at the very core of reality like he's present and exposed and vulnerable and available and so for us to show like reflect not just to ourselves but even to others but especially to jesus that like we know that then to genuflect on both knees is a very um laudable thing to do and really again exposes us to to grace so i would i would highly recommend that practice too yeah. Father Joe, have you ever genuflected while going into the row at the movie theater? <laughs> I have. Have you heard me tell that story? <laughs> no, do you tell that story? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, that's, that's a you know your Catholic when story, right? I walked into a movie theater and uh, genuflected and then went into the row that my, me and my sisters were going into. <laughs> okay. You know your Catholic when, yes. Oh, right. I'm at a movie theater, not church. 
Um, great, two great questions. Thank you, Bobro family, for these. Um, I feel like these might be coming back at me. First, uh, what is an indulgence in perpetuum? I think I think you were right in thinking that coming back at you. Um, another name for an indulgence in perpetuum is a plenary indulgence, which is a distinction that the church makes in understanding this um, indulgence that's um, gift from the church as a sign of not just the forgiveness of the sins, but an indulgence um, recognizes our satisfaction of that forgiveness. Huh? So an indulgence doing a pious practice and right. Sometimes there's a, a misconception that like all indulgences are bad, right? Isn't that why we had the great Protestant reformation is because the church was doing these indulgences. It's like wrong. <laughs> I mean, partially or misunderstood. It's not that we were doing indulgences. It's that we were selling them, which is scandalous, right? I would have been like, Holy Father, what the heck is going on here, right? We do indulgences not because uh, we don't receive indulgences because we pay for them. We receive indulgences because we take a half hour to, out of our day to join a Zoom rosary and pray the rosary together with 150 other people, right? That act of faith allows us to be open to receiving this um, indulgence. Um, an indulgence, it's not just a forgiveness of sins, but it's also a remission of the temporal punishment due to sin. So that even though um, I'm forgiven, there's still a punishment that's due. And so in perpetuum, or a, a plenary, is a full remission of all of that punishment due to sin that might await us in, um, in purgatory. So you want to do those practices. And right now in Corona time, there's just like an abundance of opportunities to do that. Um, praying a rosary, praying a divine mercy chaplet, reading scripture for a half hour, making a spiritual communion, right? All of these things that if we do that, pray for our Holy Father's intentions, um, make a spiritual or um, a perfect contrition and pray for the Holy Father's intentions. Did I already say that? Yeah. In a spiritual communion. Then we receive that perpetual indulgence or plenary indulgence. Great question. Thank you. Yeah. Why? Uh, okay. Did Mary die before she was assumed into heaven? This is a fun one too. Yeah. I don't, know. <laughs> no. I don't like the way this works. Um, <laughs> this is a great question. Uh, the, sh the short of the answer is, no. Um, the, I remember going over th like this idea of the assumption with, with a buddy of mine and we both studied math and we were kind of like talking, like looking at the theory, looking at the doctrine and trying to like figure out um, basically like what's the answer in the back of the book? What's the bottom line? What's the thing that like you circle and it's like, this is what we teach, right? And basically what, what we understand is that Mary was assumed body and soul into heaven, that death is a result of original sin, and it's where the soul leaves the body. And we don't know exactly what it, what it looks like. Maybe it was like the very instant that she took her last breath, or maybe while she was sleeping is more of um, kind of a, an Eastern under, understanding. Um, but we don't want to say that that she did die, that her soul ever was separated from her body. There was, there was a way that she was able to be preserved. And, and even, I guess there's, um, I think it's Raphael, who has a great depiction of the assumption. It's like a two paneled painting where on the bottom panel, you have the, like, I guess the sarcophagus of the Blessed Mother and all of the apostles looking in and wonderment and amazement is like, it's empty. And there are like all these flowers coming out. It's like, where is she? And then you have in the top panel, the blessed mother being crowned by her son as queen of heaven and earth. And it's like, ah, so maybe they laid her in the sarcophagus and not that she died, but that by all appearances, she had, she had passed, but she was preserved from death and body and soul because of her purity and sinlessness. She was brought up into heaven. 
any nuances to that or anything you want to no, I think that's totally accurate. I, the language that I, it seems is most often used is that she fell asleep. Going from the Blessed Mother to scruples. Oh. Father Joe, what are scruples? Are, are they bad? Are they, could they be good? Um, how, how do you get rid of them if you do suffer from them? And I, I guess we want to like, I just realize or acknowledge a lot of people do struggle from scrupulosity and it's, it's a great suffering. So if you do suffer from this, um, know that like, yeah, our hearts, especially as priests and confessors go out to you because it's, uh, oh, it's a, a real suffering, but yeah. Yeah. And that, that's why I kind of, oh, took my head back and moaned. It is such a suffering. Um, so when people are talking about scruples or being scrupulous or scrupulosity, uh, it's an obsession with sin, basically. Did I, did I commit this sin? Have I committed a sin? And it, it becomes, I'm not, I'm not talking in the, in the demonic sense that we just talked about obsession with, but it can become a real obsession about being scrupulous. Now, I don't know if that term was ever used positively. I would say the positive way of, of saying scrupulous would be prudent, aware, doing a good examination of conscience. But at least in my, my mind, when people talk about being scrupulous, you talk about being, did I commit a sin? Is this a sin? How bad of a sin? Is it a mortal sin? Is it a venial sin? Was it a, do I have to go to confession? Should I go to confession? How do I, you know, it, it, there's just this real over-concentration on sin and if I'm committing sin. Um, Father Adam, does that sound accurate in your it does sound accurate, yeah. Okay. And maybe could could you speak on, have you ever had any success in kind of helping someone along a path of kind of being free from this obsession over um, maybe the littlest of an infraction or the possibility of sinning or thinking that like the, a little sin is really a great sin or how would someone go about seeking freedom? Yeah, I, I think... Um... In, in the, the experience that I have working with people with scrupulosity, um, it has to do with our image of God and our understanding of grace. So a lot of times it stretch, stretches back into our childhood with things where maybe uh, sin was really emphasized in the home. I'm, I'm not, I'm giving generalizations here, but often sin was very prominent in the home this is a sin every time the child would you know was get corrected it was you committed a sin you're you know you have to ask forgiveness from god rather than just saying like bobby don't hit your sister or something like that um so i think that the, i don't know if i've had success helping people with scrupulosity but i think the biggest thing is addressing the image of god and the workings of grace so in the scrupulous mind, God can become this um, overbearing father. It's just waiting, just waiting for you to mess up and he's going to get you. And that's, that's not him. Uh, so I think to undo the wrong image of God and receive the right image of God would be a real key. I remember one time I was at St. Paul Cathedral. Where there's a chapel upstairs and I was... Um, I went in, I had committed a sin, was really beating myself up, went into the chapel, knelt down. I wasn't praying, but I knelt down and I just knelt down in front of the Lord and I was beating myself up in front of the Lord. And I kind of convinced myself that um, God must feel about me how I feel about me. And God must see me how I see me. And I tell you that that is not true. And I heard God say very clearly, he said this to me very clearly, Joe, the God you think I am, I am not. And what he was saying was, don't you put your image of yourself onto me. And don't you beat yourself up because you think that's what I'm doing right now. That don't, that's not me. You got me wrong. I, that's, I, I'm not that guy. I'm not that God. So I, I think 
we need, that's why it's so important to study theology well. Because the way that we imagine God is the way that we relate to him. If I imagine Father Adam Potter is very harsh and cruel and mean and difficult, first of all, I wouldn't come on with him, right? But if I did come on, I'd be intimidated and scared by him. So I'd have the wrong image of my mind in him. I'd have the right image of my mind, then I can relate to him properly. It's the same with God. We have the wrong image of God in our minds, we're going to relate to him wrongly. So where do we look to find the proper image of God? Jesus. He's the fullness of the revelation of the Father and his love for us. So if you want to know what God looks like, read the Gospels in the light of the Holy Spirit, in the light of the tradition of the church. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father, says Jesus. And that's, that's it. Yeah, it allows us to know um, the mercy of the Father. and to not fear, to not fear, but always to know that we can turn back to him. Um, so grateful for all of your questions, by the way. So thanks, thanks for pouring them out. And um, yeah, some great ones here. We have some questions about receiving Holy Communion and I wanted to um, transition and answer that. Um, there's a question about what the significance of taking communion on one's knees is. This person has seen a lot of them do that. Um, at one place versus another, and maybe a related question is, that I think is a, a valid question. Is, do you think average Catholics have lost reverence for the Holy Eucharist due to receiving in the hand? I'll be happy to weigh in on those after you. I don't know if you guys know this. Father Adam's really very gifted in regards to the liturgy and the mass and the historical significance. And so me, not so much, but I just listen to oh. people. But so why don't you, if I, if I have anything to add, why don't you address those? Great. Um, I think there's uh yeah, there's a lot to be said about this. There's um, I think an understanding of, receiving communion in the hand that was really popularized in the last 50 years from the Second Vatican Council that saw the first mass as not just being the sacrifice on Calvary, but also intimately connected with the Last Supper, right? And it was there that the, the first mass was celebrated. The first Holy Eucharist was given out. Right, and so that when we come to mass, it's a meal, and it's the altar, but it's also a a table as well, right? And so this was really, really emphasized. And so, like you would eat a meal, so you would receive the Eucharist too, and even the the connection of especially the Second Vatican Council fathers was like to allow what happened most. Um, immediately in the scriptures to not be lost and so that we can have that. And so the, the thought might be, look, those who were with Jesus at that first mass, they weren't on their knees. They were reclined to table and they took bread and they passed it around. They broke it and they, and they did that. And so like, so why should we be afraid to receive communion in the hand? And it's like, okay, on the surface, fair enough. And I'll tell you right now, uh, the church has, uh, allowed, given a dispensation to um, to us in the, the church to allow communion in the hand. And so that's okay. If you come up to me and ask for communion in the hand, you be like, body of Christ. Um, is there something that's lost whenever we aren't kneeling? I, I would say there's a lot to be gained by kneeling. Read the scriptures and read what the reaction is of those disciples, of those people, whenever they realize it's the Lord, mm -hmm. right? They fall down on their knees. And even though the word in Greek is connected with prostration, worship, right? So it's not just like they kneel down and they have their pious hands, like they're on their faces, right? It's like, oh my God, it's you, Jesus, you're the Lord, right? And so that's the response of adoration, of devotion is to be on our knees, right? 
So to consider, like, when the priest says body of Christ, what's our reaction? Like, amen. <laughs> Maybe still chewing gum or whatever, thinking about, like, I'm back in our pews, and I wonder if, like, I can get bowed to my car. It's like, that, uh, that a proper and maybe even just like uh, a more full response to that living God of the universe, Jesus in the Eucharist being before us, would be for us to fall down on our knees, doesn't seem to be inappropriate. Um, is there a, a, a case to be made for the lack of reverence coming from not genuflecting and not, not receiving on the, the tongue? There's absolutely in my mind a correlation is there a causation uh in all honesty i would argue yeah right it's <laughs> whenever we go from um greater reverence from receiving on the tongue to kneeling um to just a standing just a familiar in our hands eating with the same hands as we eat any other meal or we go through McDonald's, Burger King, and yep, we get our same. It's like, I think there might be pause for a confusion coming in that I don't just receive this meal like I receive any other meal. But what about the apostles? They received with their hands. Remember who those apostles are. They're the first priests. And by the order of ordination, the church has understood it from the very beginning that it's only the priest whose hands are literally consecrated and um, like, like ours, um, or I guess mine by Bishop Zubik, it was doused in oil, right? Consecrating my hands. Why? For principally to be able to offer the holy sacrifice of the mass and to be able to hold the living God of the universe, Jesus in the Eucharist. So there is something there that is not just like though that was anybody at the last supper. They were the first priests. I'm going to cut myself off. Father Joe, do you want to add anything? I did a great job. I, I, it's also important to remember that the Mass that we attend is not a reenactment of the Last Supper. If it was a reenactment of the Last Supper, you know, me and Father Adam would grow much fuller beards and we'd lay down on our side and we, so it's not a reenactment. The, the Mass that we celebrate is not a reenactment of the Last Supper. The representation of the sacrifice of Calvary. So, uh, I, I, the scripture comes to mind for me about kneeling and receiving communion. There's the famous scripture verse: "At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in the heavens, on the earth, and under the earth." So it's not just the name of Jesus, right, that we're receiving. It's Jesus. So if we kneel at the name of Jesus, I don't know. It would seem appropriate to kneel at Jesus Himself. As far as communion on hand goes, I, I really appreciate everything you said. I think practically as a priest for me, um, it's so much easier for people to take hosts, either purposefully to do something to them, or they don't know, they're Protestant, they came with their friend, they're at a funeral, they're at a wedding. I can't, maybe it's been 20 times where somebody has taken the Eucharist in their hand, not knowing what to do, so put it in their pocket or threw it on the pew or something like that. You can't do that. You know immediately as a priest when somebody comes up, if they stick it, you know they're Catholic or not. And, and so you save them great embarrassment, and you save us trying to track somebody else down and say, hey, what are you doing? Or, oh, I didn't know what that was. And then I would say this, um, each particle of the host contains the whole Jesus, contains the whole Christ. So... When, you, when we take communion on and this isn't judgment, the church allows for taking communion on a hand. So, but when you take communion on a hand, I don't know how you cannot have particles on your hand. And then what do you do with those particles? As priests, what we do is we pour water over our fingers. That's what you see at the purification. So no particles would be lost even off of our fingers. The last thing I'll say for communion on the tongue is this. It's so childlike and so humble. Mm. How do we feed our little ones? With a spoon, we go, here comes the airplane. And you feed them on the tongue. What did Jesus say? 
unless you become like a child, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. There's nothing more humbling or childlike to come up Open your mouth, and I've seen some of your teeth, let's be honest. Just kidding. <laughs> and put out your tongue. It's a very humble, humble childlike gesture. So I'm not judging, condemning anybody out there that receives on the hand. Um, just speaking about some of the observations that I, as a priest, would have. I know there was concern about the transmission of the coronavirus. Um, in terms of receiving communion, that um, maybe there was a, a recommendation of receiving communion in the hand to stop the virus from being trans, transmitted. And I think that was thrown around. I think it was also thrown around by a lot of people who aren't microbiologists or <laughs> virologists or anything like that. Um, I'm not any of those. And so I wouldn't be qualified to be able to say that the virus is a lot less transmitted through placing it in the hand versus placing it on someone's tongue. Um, I saw no experience or like evidence of that, science to back that up. If anything, there seems to be a lot more hand-to-hand -hand contact than my ability just to place it gently, softly on the host, on someone's tongue. So. Um, if I really think it's an abuse of authority if a, a, a priest or pastor said, because of the coronavirus, you have to receive in the hands, right? Like you have a canonical right to receive communion on the tongue. And there was no science to back up that, um, that it was spread less through hand, communion in the hand versus communion in the tongue. So I hope that helps to answer your, your question. Although I know it was, a lot of this was, done and just trying to really be careful and um, yeah, really for the concern of the common good. So this is one of the reasons too, folks, why seminary is so enjoyable because for three or four or five or seven years, you sit around and talk about these things and debate and go back and forth and fight and have opinions and at least for me, it was just a time of great, great enjoyment because this is what we, there's nothing more interesting than what we're talking about. And that's what you get to do when you're studying. You need a lot, lot going on in the seminary. But this is the discussions that we had all the time. So Father Adam said a bunch of times, thanks for all the questions. It's just thoroughly enjoyable. <laughs> um, during those years in Rome where I was learning theology through an Italian language that I didn't know, I was definitely learning more theology at the lunch and dinner table than I was in the classroom. I was like, what was that? What was happening? What was, and, but like the conversation, the discussion, it was just so fruitful and life-giving. And um, anyway, one of the questions that might've been thrown out there that I'm throwing to you, Father Joe, was did Mary know? There, did she know? There's the song, Mary, did you know? I love that song. I'm a big fan. I love that song. Are you ready to defend it? So um, I'm thankful. I think your name's Ed for um, this question. How much of Jesus's dual nature and his destiny did Mary really know and or understand? Talks, Luke talks a lot about Mary pondering and treasuring these things in her heart. Did her recognition of Jesus's mission grow over time? Yeah. I don't know if you want to defend the song or just answer the question. <laughs> I love that song. It's going to be played at my funeral, everybody. <laughs> um, I think uh, <laughs> you just, that, that eagle's wings. I love it. Um, you, you, can, you can correct me, but I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Uh, so no, did, what Mary would have known unless God infused her with knowledge was what she would have known from the angel, right? But I can't imagine that Mary understood perfectly what the angel Gabriel was saying when he said everything. Would she have understood uh, homoousios, with, you know, the, the union of God with man, um, his divine natures, but his, his um, human, per or his divine person, but his human and divine nature. I... 
Mary would have grown an understanding of who this Jesus was, who her son was, while knowing explicitly that he was the son of God upon conception. So that would be my answer. She knew he was the son of God upon conception because that's what the angel said. But then she would have had to grow into an understanding of what this mystery was. Yeah, no, um, Thomas Aquinas makes a distinction between uh, knowledge and understanding that's, that's really important, right? I mean, how much did Mary know about the, the dual nature of Jesus or the Trinitarian communion of, of God, of the three persons in one nature? And um, she definitely, right, or like any of the apostles compared to right now, we've had all of these councils to be able to explain it and to define it and to give us this language and this words um, that are beautiful that maybe we might say like, oh man, look, I know more about the Trinity that, or about Jesus than they did. And I would just would need to be careful, right? Like that we would know more about Jesus than the Blessed Mother who was given this revelation through an angel. Um, John the Beloved who rested his head on the heart of Jesus. Like he may not have been able to talk about like two natures perfectly united um, and one divine person, but he knew Jesus. Mm -hmm. How much did he understand and have the language for? Well, that's something that has developed over time. And so Mary, yeah, she, she knew. Did you know that your baby boy would one day rule? Like, yes, that he will be a king, son of the most high God. Like she heard that and she knew it. And that's Elizabeth's blessing to Elizabeth, Mary, Elizabeth's blessing to Mary. Like, blessed are you who believed that the promises made you by the Lord would be fulfilled. So yeah, she knew and she believed in this, in this perfect way. Um, understanding, I think that understanding of like, how is my heart going to be here so that the secret thoughts of many might be revealed? I don't know that she would have understood that it's going to look like Calvary on the cross, but she knew her whole heart was going to have to be poured out just like her son's. Is that fair? Father? Uh, yes. Yeah, it's right on. And right, she pondered all these things in her heart. Um, it like it was an immediate understanding for sure. That yeah, that's, that sounds great. Awesome. Thanks for that question. Um, John chapter one verse four. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. What exactly is or was the light of men? I just read about this in Frank Sheets' uh, Theology and Sanity book, which is like the next step from the book that I recommended, Highly Theology for Beginners. But I can't remember what it said. <laughs> um, this life was the light of men. I think I'll, I'll stall while Father Adam's looking it up. That's what it looks like he's doing to me. Um, John, the prologue of John, by the way, is so extraordinary. At the end of exorcisms, they have the person who's just been dispossessed or freed read John's prologue. Um, this life was the light of men. I don't know if I could give a good answer. Great. Allow me <laughs> to try. Um, thanks for this question. It's a, it's a great one. The, the reality is that um, all things John's saying in um, John 1, 2, that all was created through him, right? The, the word, the logos, like the intelligibility, the, the creation, the, the mind of God. It was through that that everything was created right so god who is life itself it's through him that the world came into being and it's through him that it's even it's intelligible it's knowable right and how do you how do you know something how do you come to understand it well it's through seeing it it's coming into contact with it and observing it and so that through this 
life through the Logos that was God and is God, that it is the light of men, right? So our very ability to be able to see and to be able to know and come in contact with the world is a reflection of God, right? Mm -hmm. That's only possible because of him. It's not because of our own, um, our own ingenuity or our own like, oh, I turn on this light and now it's like, I see this based on my own, like our, all of our ability to have access to anything is borrowed from God in, in a sense. <laughs> um, and, and in that there's there, a real understanding of the closeness of God, even in that almost like taken for granted ability to, to see in the light versus the dark. Yeah. Beautiful. Makes sense? Makes sense to me, yeah. Well, I'm grateful. We had, um, I've been trying to provoke some good questions, stump the priests, and I feel like you all came through. So thanks for that. Hopefully that was, that was helpful. We got to just about all, all of the questions, I think. If I did miss you, sorry, there was a lot of personal messaging going on. So I'm just grateful for all of you and um, your questions, throwing them out there. Father Joe, thanks for your answers humor yeah, love it. thank you let's close in prayer and um i guess before we do just uh say plan on, on doing this again another sump the priest q a this coming sunday at, at 8 p.m so in the meantime be thinking about questions difficulties and we'll do our best to answer them in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen Heavenly Father, we're just so grateful for you're a good God. You are the very life of the world, and it's through you that we come to see, we come to know, and even recognize your presence, the way that you're working, living, and moving in our, our lives. And just thank you for the ways that you've been present in, in this conversation. Thank you for the hearts, minds, souls, lives of each and every one of these persons on this call for Lord they're here because you want them here you're doing something in their life to bring them closer to you so I just rejoice in that I thank you for that and I ask you to confirm bless and sanctify every single grace that you've given allow this time allow their generosity to bear much fruit may your mercy be poured out in abundance so that your life might be shown to the, all the world through their lives, their hearts, and their burning love for you. Through the intercession of our Blessed Mother Mary, St. Catherine of Siena, may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you all. So good to be with you. Have a great night. Look forward to seeing you again next time.